I'm David Bollier. I direct the Reinventing the Commons program at the Schumacher Center for New Economics in Massachusetts. And I'm a commons activist and scholar, blogger, and networker of people. My name is Pascal Gatsen. I'm the head of the Master Fashion Design here at Artes. Uh, and I make clothes. <laughs> So Sylvia Federici has this quote that I used in my presentation and it says, if commoning has any meaning, we have to produce ourselves as a common subject. And living in the United States, I have found that to be a very difficult thing because I've been in the work cooperative environment, I've been part of the co-op academy and it seems to be very difficult and I visited Mondragon and people say, oh, that's a cultural thing because they've been <laughs> fighting the, they've been fighting their in, in, independence. So they're, 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 it's natural that the worker cooperative can take root there because there's a cultural inclination to cooperate and to feel mm -hmm. kind of a sense of togetherness. And in the United States, that has been very difficult because they proudly say that there are 386 co worker cooperatives in the United States, but if you imagine the bigness of the United States, that's quite a challenging number, I think. Well, the United States is so intensely a market individualist society that people have trouble conceiving themselves as part of a collective. Uh, my colleagues and I like to use the term the nested eye meaning we're not just an individual, we're nested within collectives. Not just because we get drift into that, but they form who we are and our identities. And I think that's kind of the challenge of our time, yeah. to imagine ourselves as human beings in collectives, not as a constraining issue, as many Americans regard it as, but as an enlivening and informing a process. And I think that ultimately is where our liberation is going to come from. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one reason why the United States is in such trouble, because mm -hmm. it is so intensely separated among itself, everybody in their own individual shell, mm -hmm. not acknowledging the existential reality of what it is to be a human being. Yes. So that's why Sylvia Federici's quote is so lovely, because we do produce ourselves through others. And I would even say that's a profound biological evolutionary principle. Yeah. We create ourselves through others mm -hmm. and uh, that's how life works. Yes. So if we talk about commoning as a verb, you said I don't, in your, in your talk the other day, you said that I don't like to think of the commons as a, as a noun or something that's static, but yeah. something that's an activity, something that we do. How, how, how do we do that? if we don't know how to do that. <laughs> well, I think that we're starting to learn of necessity, of desperation, emergency, planetary emergency. We're starting to have to discover how to negotiate with each other, work with each other, communicate, deal with our emotions together. And I think, you know, a lot of people think that the commons is some magical utopia that just happens, but it's hard work, there's conflict. It doesn't always work, um, but I think it is the more stable, uh, humanly satisfying way of being, as opposed to the fanciful dreams of consumerism or capitalism, which we're seeing the pathologies of that whole process. Right. Which gets me to thinking, I want to understand from you how you think fashion is a potentially powerful vehicle for commenting uh, artistically and socially and even politically. Um, for me, fashion is our commons, or it's, mm -hmm. a, it's the common ground. It's not happening outside of us, it's happening because mm -hmm. we're in relationship and we want to be in relationship, we want to belong, and I think we express that through our clothes. In 2014, I did a project where I worked, I was invited by a museum in Japan and they asked me to do something with the uniform of the guards. <laughs> and the guards in, in Japan are traditionally women. So I said, I don't want to do something, I don't want to design a new uniform, but I would love to work with the women and teach them how to make their own uniforms. Yeah. So two weeks before the opening of the exhibition, I went there and I worked with eight women, eight of the guards, eight of the 32 guards. Mm. 
And the condition was, because I thought I could work effectively with eight women doing that, the condition was that they then would teach the other guards how to make their own uniform. And it was an amazing process. We, I used consensus decision mm. making, all the things that I've actually learned by living in New York, mm. because I found a community there that I felt very connected to. And so through those types of processes, we came to agreements on what the uniform would be and what they would make. So we kind of made a simple base, and on that they would elaborate with fabrics that were emotional to them. They would mm. apply handcrafts to them, or whatever they felt they wanted to. One uh, guard wrote us her uh, thesis on it <laughs> that she was very proud of on Monet. So it was both a uniform but individual as well. It was individualized by each of them, but the beautiful thing was, so it started with a uniform white shape, mm -hmm. then they started to apply their own emotional and connections, mm -hmm. and I asked them to be inspired by the exhibit, because they are in the exhibition mm -hmm. always, so I asked them to be inspired. But what was the beautiful thing, so they taught the other guards to make their own uniform, and because they were in the presence of each other for three months during the du duration of they started to exchange skills, they started to exchange mm -hmm. gifts because they were grateful, for one was grateful for, for another one teaching them something. And it, they developed their own uniform language again. I, that's, you know, that's fascinating because I find that that kind of collaboration is generative at a very deep level mm -hmm. and in open-ended, unpredictable ways. Yes. I had not, I, this project was so successful for me because I, couldn't have imagined the outcome of this. Mm -hmm. The fact that they took it forward, that the museum facilitated that, that it wasn't left with me working with the eight guards, mm. but they were really inspired. The other guards wanted to be part of it. It was so generative and so beautiful and so... The fact that, it, that there was uniformity in the end, which was, came completely from, from their community and from being in the presence of each other. And what happened, and that was, I think, very beautiful as well. I, the, all the guards wrote me a letter that worked with me in advance. And one said, I'm very shy, I'm always in the background, but I would really love to participate. Mm. She had very distinct uh, handcraft skills. She became the leader of it. They're still together now, it's now, it's four years later. <laughs> they give workshops themselves, they make products, they have a product line that they sell. Mm. It's amazing. They are really and it came out of love it came out of respect and it came out of giving to each other what's fascinating is that's you're articulating a very different world view and even an ontology than standard economics which says that you're rational self-serving materialistic and so forth which we know to be partial if not false mm -hmm. uh, but this other world view has so little standing as a generative way to remake the world, to meet needs, to live a happy life. Yes. And I think that's why I think the commons is so useful to this conversation, because it helps name something that is often very elusive or intangible, but extremely powerful and generative. Yes. That's a fantastic story. Yes. Well, let me ask a question, though. How do you think that sensibility can reach a larger number of people, expand, in ways that are not just confined to a small group? Is there institutional means? Is there some way of propagating that? that that's a question mark for me. Well, I think education is, is, is mm. essential. I think the way we are educated now is criminal. It's, I get so upset when I think about most educations in the world. Mm. It really hurts me, and it hurts my heart, and it makes me feel sad, actually, mm. at the moment. Because people are put into expectations and into boxes and into competition and into that are foreign to them mm -hmm. and that don't nurture the natural capacity mm -hmm. they have to learn and to grow, to be curious, to connect. Everybody wants to. Mm -hmm. A child learns by connecting to other children. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. And education is doing the opposite thing. It, it, it boxes in, us into individual kind of space. I, rem I remember distinctly. When I went to school for the first time, I all of a sudden had to sit in rows and I had to sit still all day. I couldn't play outside. I was always playing outside, but I was not allowed. I was not part of the curriculum. 
So something very destructive happens once we enter educational institutions. But to be a little harsh, would you be educating people for a world that doesn't exist? In, in other words, how do we create that new world after the education begins? You mean if we would educate them for the comments, for instance? Yes, for example. I mean, I struggle with this because uh, we know that so many people would love to learn that way and develop capacities, yes. and then they enter a world that is hostile to that, or there's no place for that. Yes. And, and I struggle with how do we invent these new vehicles for commenting, for meeting our needs in different ways than the large corporation or the large bureaucracy. What I was actually struck by your presentation yesterday was the fact that the commons used to be tied to place mm. and to time. And I think there's something in there that's really important. Like you mentioned the caring for the, I mean, uh, the piece of land would kind of signify when how much it could give or how much. It, there was a definite relationship between the people who worked the land, who lived on the land, who mm. exchanged with the land. So there was a kind of... A, Contextual organic connection. Yes. And I think that one could say this cuts very deep because the Enlightenment celebrated and moder modernity celebrates that we can liberate ourselves from time and place. <laughs> and this is, is, is this truly a liberation? Yes. Or is it a dead end? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I think that's what we're discovering. Yes. Uh, I, I think part of our challenge is to find ways to reintegrate ourselves with time and place. And that's the only way we can be fully human. Yes. Uh, but it's a struggle in today's uh, global, pervasive global commerce uh, yes. and a world that, the sensibility of modernity, which is every corner of our lives. Yes. And I think it's the pro we want that we need to have the proliferation of these small things because I think as the cultural landscape becomes more populated, our imaginations become enlivened with, well, if you can do that for garbage collection, yes. <laughs> why not, you know, and you've done it with, with weaving. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's, it's a matter of, I mean, I know of a, a theater commons in Boston, it's called HowlRound. Well, who would have thought that theater people could create a commons and, and so on. It, it's happening in many different arenas. And uh, I find a great deal of hope in these dismal times just knowing that those things exist. Yes. For me, nonviolent communication has been a big uh, revelation. Because mm. I always find communication so difficult. And like Michael Bober, like if we cannot communicate, it kind of stops very quickly. Well, it sort of gets back to how do we be authentic human beings instead of dealing it with these displaced aggressions or unmet needs. Yeah. And nonviolent communication is obviously a way of surfacing our authentic selves. Yeah. And I think we don't have enough vehicles for doing that in deliberate yes. ways. And for communities in which that is seen as something that's valuable. Mm -hmm. To talk about what is really alive in you, which is, it's not easy to <laughs> discover what is alive in you. But once you discover it, it's kind of liberating to, to be able to... In doubly liberating that when you express it, Oh, I was feeling that too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I also was anxious to start this interview. <laughs> yeah, so for me, there is a, there, it's a great tool. It's, it's a strategy, it's a tool, and it's something that's very counter-habitual, so it's not easy to kind of integrate. But I do feel that once we start to feel more confident in the world through our communication and being able to connect to people mm -hmm. and not constantly encounter disconnection through our communication, I think we might have a chance that we might enjoy <laughs> commoning. <laughs> but but it, it, it does imply a significant break from some of the prevailing ways of governance, yes. which is me leader, you follower, yes. uh, me CEO, you employee, and so forth. Yes. And I think our social imaginary of the ways we can behave with each other has to change. Yes. And, uh, so it's these kind of movements that we're in at the moment. I think that that's essential and I think language is an important role in helping to open up these possibilities to get out of the certain ruts of thinking and language that we use to discuss the future possibilities for change. Yes.